So good morning. I think we get started. Hope our technical questions get resolved. And I give you a very warm welcome um, to that last session of Literary Cities, for which I am very glad to present the two writers, William Slovo and Kevin Ireland. My name is Christina Jorcic, and some of you might remember me from the hiking tour to the lakes to Kovadonga. Um, as I was thinking of on how to <clears throat> start my introduction for today's panel, I was thinking uh, on which things I might have in common um, <laughs> with the two of them being acknowledgedly a little bit unfamiliar with their work as I am uh, a scholar of post-colonial transnational literature in German. Um, finally, I came up with being one of three sisters, um, as Jillian Slovo is, and uh, with sharing a strong love for nature uh, with Kevin Ireland, but I decided um, that was uh, not such a good starting point. So. Um, <laughs> Um, I let myself get inspired by yesterday's round table um, of writing the urban. The authors there described their relationships with the cities they lived in and were writing about in very different terms. And I found it interesting that um, their urban engagements were often described in terms of tense relationships um, that ranged between wooing, conquering, resisting, and rejecting. And so it's not always a love story that will be told. Both horses have lived and still, in the case of Gillian Slovo, are still living in London. Uh, Gillian Slovo since she's 12 and Karen Ireland for 20 years while he was uh, working as a journalist for the Times. Um, and I think both of them had to get to terms with living in this big city. So today I hope we will be intrigued by um, their stories. And let me just briefly introduce Gillian Slovo, uh, which is of course a terrible task for me to um, describe in one minute an author of her range. Um, she is South African born, but as I already mentioned, she has been living in the UK, in London, since she was 12 years old. Um, she started writing first as a crime writer, and as she uh, acknowledged in several interviews, she felt safe with that because she liked um, centering on the plot, and but then in the new millennium she went off to new boundaries and she engaged with emotions and characters, and very much so. And she also left London, uh, which was the setback or this the, was like the the scenario of her crime novels. And she went out to places as far as South Africa, Russia, or most be better saying uh, the Soviet Union with Leningrad or Khartoum, mm, only to come back recently in her last novel, mm, 10 Days to London. And I also have to mention that her She's not only a renowned novelist, but she's also a playwright. Uh, for example, she co-authored um, the play Guantanamo, Honor Bound to Defend Freedom, and also in 2011, the play The Riots, which is connected to her novel um, of 10 days. Also, she's very well known as a memoirist, publishing in 1997 um, the autobiographical book Every Secret Thing, My Family, My Country, which was followed by another volume of autobiographical fiction, 2014, Merhaba Sinem. 
So we are very happy to welcome her today. And please, Gillian, um, all yours. Thank you. Public. If you're not the middle of the three daughters, then we have nothing in common. <laughs> <laughs> Makes a big difference. It does, it does. I'm the eldest, so... Yeah, no, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. I, I'm going to um, read from my latest ten days, and then if I have time, I might choose one of, one of the others, which is somewhere else. And ten days is actually set in the London I know. It's London now, um, but not quite now. Um, and it goes into um, three different worlds. One, the world of politicians as a riot breaks out, um, of a home secretary who is trying to get his prime minister's job. And I wrote this before um, Theresa May became prime minister and all hell broke out in the Conservative Party. Um, and the second one is the world of the police who are trying to control this riot that has broken out. And the third one is the world of ordinary people living in a very poor part of London, which I made up because I didn't want anybody to draw parallels with any particular part of London, particularly after the riots that started in Tottenham. And I didn't want it to be about the Tottenham riots. Um, so this is Rockham, and what I've chosen to read to you today, um, a, a brief bit out, is of somebody else uh, um, who is also, like me, an outsider. But he's an outsider insider because he's a riot policeman. So riot police have no particular place that they are. They go where the trouble is, um, and they go wearing the kind of uniforms that you can't even see who they are. Um, and they're the, sort of the toughest of the tough and um, sometimes considered by their own um, um, police forces as hooligans. Um, so this is 3.15 in the morning and a riot has broken out and my, my main character is a man called Billy. Rockham had once been Billy's beat. Poor as it undoubtedly was, he'd come across a lot of good people here. At this point, however, as pillaging took the place of protest, he was beginning to hate the whole borough and all who sailed in her, without exception. Don't you even think of sleeping. The sergeant in front of Billy grasped one of his drooping constables by the shoulder, or oh, I'll lay you out myself. His fingers must have passed through padding and into bone and dug in hard because the constable tried to shake him off, thus shaking himself back into the moment. Now the sergeant strode behind the line of six constables, walloping each on the helmet as he passed. Hold the line, his voice loud enough to penetrate the pandemonium. Hold the fucking line. His shouting was designed as the counter to the people who were banging and throwing things and blowing on car horns, creating a racket so deafening it was enough to disorient the strongest man. This combined with the fear that they must all be experiencing, could produce a kind of tunnel vision in which their hearing would also close down. Their sergeant's voice, to which they were so acclimatised, was there to break through this, which it clearly did. Their muscle memories kicking in, the men lined up closer to each other. You're doing a great job. Keep formation. He'd been shouting for so long... His voice was breaking, but now he somehow managed to raise it to another level. Keep together. Here they come. Shields high. They lifted their shields and held them high as a line of youth ran at them, stopping within hailing distance and letting loose a barrage of splintered paving stones that, lit by the starbust of a flaring firework, soon came raining down. A second pack of rioters they were beginning to organise themselves, followed, also throwing their makeshift missiles, and then came one of those now familiar pauses that punctuated this ritual, attack, counterattack, and retreat, having gone on for hours, leaving both sides exhausted. They used this moment before rearmament and repulsion to try to out-eyeball each other. Into the hiatus, the sergeant yelled, sit rep on the left, to stop his men being hypnotized by the other side 
And sure enough, the descriptions of the looting taking place down the side street furnished by the officer on the left was enough to pull them out of any such possible trance. The sergeant transmitted the information back to Billy, who nodded and waved to indicate that they should move towards the line of youths already in the process of reforming. Forward on my count, the sergeant yelled, one, two, and together, charge. They were members of the Met's territorial support group, the toughest of the tough, bulked out by the gin and protein shakes, and they were a ferocious sight, especially when on the move. Charge, their sergeant ordered, and they charged, one of their number boiling out Semper Paratus, which he must have lifted off the Manchester TAU, and then repetitively Semper Paratus, until his comrades took up the cry, changing it to Semper fucking Paratus, as with all the courage of the slogan, they charged forward, scattering the opposition. Not that they had gone for long. They were guerrilla fighters, albeit in expensive tracksuits and branded trainers, whose only objective was to ruck with Billy's men. His men, on the other hand, who could have been capable of controlling a much bigger crowd if members of that crowd had stayed together, were slowed down by their cumbersome kit and the need to protect each other and the public. They must be itching to lay hands on the yobs, but to do so was to risk isolation, and woe betide any man who found himself alone in this mob. Stop, Billy called his instruction, passed on by the sergeant's halt, halt, to which the group responded by wheeling to a halt and at their sergeants call, yelled, regroup, reforming themselves into a line. They'd gained another 10 yards, and even that was dangerous. Their safest bet would have been to consolidate their position at the earlier crossroads rather than trying to force forward to the next. But because fires were being set, they had to forge ahead. To add to their difficulties, an orgiastic bath of thievery seemed to have taken hold of the whole community. Only five minutes previously, Billy had spotted an apparently respectable middle-aged couple pushing a trolley piled so high with nappies and powdered baby milk that they could have kept a Romanian orphanage going for a month. He had watched them coming close, close enough to clock him. Their panic at the sight of him almost made him laugh, but it didn't take them long to figure out what he already knew, that there was no way he could expose himself or abandon his men by nicking them, and so they slowly trundled away, and they were the ones to be laughing. Too dumb to see the blinking of an overhead CCTV camera. That would soon have them laughing on the other side of their faces. CCTV was all very well, but still it rankled not to catch people in the act. But Billy needed the men to push on while keeping them and the innocent safe. It was a job made more difficult by the ever-present plague of sightseers. Women, some with babies in arms, would you believe, were laughing and cheering and pointing as if this was a circus they had paid to see even though Billy knew, should the criminals decide to turn on the onlookers, as they might easily do, these decent people of Rockham would be the first to expect protection from his men. They were unlikely to get it. Having left a contingent of officers outside the police station and dispatched another to ring-fence the solvent factory, this group of constables and their sergeant were the only mobile and kitted out representatives of law and order in a three mile crime scene of arson, robbery and riot. What they were doing and the length of time they would most likely have to keep on doing it required almost a superhuman effort. They were a long way off from being able to establish order. The red in the air indicated premises ablaze and the police were nowhere near. The clang of pipes dragged against corrugated iron was a signal to other looters to come and help lever security gates off shop entrances, and the police weren't there either. And although a section of his precious TSG had control of the perimeter of the solvent factory, if any of these young animals got wind of this strategic target, that too would soon be lost. Billy, a voice sounded in his ear, are you still there? 
Where the fuck else was there for him to go? Yes, he said, I'm here. There are fresh messages coming through on the FWIN. You need to hear them. So I'm going to stop there because um, this book is set between these two different communities and what happens during and after the riots. Um, and, and what I'm going to do is move centuries now because I think one of the things that I thought about when th thinking about writing cities is that I've actually chosen to write in a number of very different cities um, in my time um, and in different time periods of cities. So I'm the person who's always going to visit cities in order to do location research because although I do think it's the novelist's job to make things up, I often think it's good to go and look what you're making things up about. So I wrote um, a book that was set in a city that no longer exists, Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg. So I'm the person who walks along Nevsky Prospect looking for um, the place where Pushkin's heroes went thundering down and all I can see is Nike Adidas um, now up. Or um, trying to find what it was like um, in the time that I was writing about, which um, was the 1930s in the Soviet Union. And also, I wrote a book, which I'm going to read from next, called An Honorable Man, which is set in Khartoum in the 1880s. And it is the story of the mad English general, General Charles Gordon, who took it into his own head to go and try and stop an Islamic rebellion that was happening in the Sudan. Um, much um, to many politicians disgust um, and ended up having his head cut off. And I wrote it um, in a time after um, Tony Blair had um, helped George Bush invade Iraq and I was kind of interested in the adventurism that can happen where people think that they can go to somebody else's country and, um, and, and save it um, from what from what it was. So I'm going to read a bit from this. And again, when I went to Khartoum, um, I did get a feel of the landscape. I got a smell of the landscape. I went on a camel, because I also have a camel regiment um, crossing the desert to try and rescue um, um, Gordon, which, which never happened. But I couldn't see Khartoum that I was looking for, the reason being that um, after General Gordon had his head cut off, um, the British, who hadn't really wanted him to go there in the first place, had to go and get their revenge. And some 15 years later, Kitchener returned, killed thousands of, um, of the um, um, Sudanese, and um, raised Khartoum to the ground and rebuilt it as a colonial city. So once again, I was walking through a city trying to find one that no longer existed. And here is some of the city that I had to imagine was there. And this is, um, this is Gordon in his first days. In Khartoum, the trumpet boys, hand-pricked from the gang of urchins who haunted the governor general's palace in search of food, were at their stations at each corner of the palace roof. Out of pity, General Gordon always chose the puniest boys, and this group was so small they had to stand on boxes to see over the parapet. They were a dirty lot, their uniforms unwashed, one stank like a badger, and layers of red sand glittered on their dark faces as if they had been rolling in the desert. Still, they were brave. Even when they were being shelled, they stuck to their posts and blew their trumpets at the general's lightest nod. We are strong, they would blow, in code. We are strong, as the general had trained them. He stood at the edge of the roof, looking out at the river, lifeblood of the city, whose banks were lined by dusty palm groves that stretched to Mogram Point, where the dark waters of the Blue Nile washed over the emerald of the white when he lifted his gaze past the river and past the green Jura fields of Tutti Island to the mudflats of the northern shore where they faded into desert, 
The blue of his eyes almost matched the blazing blue of the midday sky. He did not seem to feel the heat. He would stand in full sun for hours, waiting for Wolseley's regiments to gallop across the shimmering land to his rescue. General Wolseley had sent a, um, an expedition to try and rescue Gordon, but because he chose a very terrible route and went down the Nile when it was um, in drought, he didn't get there in time. Not Will, and Will is the General Gordon's batman, not Will thought that they should be here very soon. Instead of dispatching a small force through the desert as he should have done, Wolsey had insisted that the huge army should drag its boats over the intractable Nile cataracts, thus delaying their arrival. Just the sort of mistake a general would make, Will muttered to himself. Will was the uno general's unofficial batman, his job was to go where General Gordon went and to do what the general asked him to do. Now he turned away from Gordon to look past Khartoum's clustered mud huts to the adjoining town of Omdurman and beyond to the biggest concentration of the enemy, the place where it was rumoured the Mahdi had set up camp. With the forest of black, green and red banners hourly increasing, it was growing faster than the others, while trailing, rising trails of dust told of many more men on their way. Not long before dusk, the general muttered. Not long until they overwhelm us, Will thought. He lifted up his eyes to the rosy bruise that was spreading under the flat blue horizon. Soon night would fall, bringing relief from the relentless heat. He smiled. The ripple of a disturbance travelled across the roof. Will's spine tingled, but he resisted the instinct to duct. There had been none of the witnessing that heralded an incoming shell. Something different then. He looked at the trumpet boys, who usually knew what was going on. They were jumping up and down and pointing to the west. He looked back in that direction and realised that what he had taken for sunset was the beginning of a sandstorm which had already grown and was moving so fast that it would soon blot out the sky. During his year in Khartoum, Will had experienced many such storms. He knew how dangerous they could be. General, he called General. He ran across the roof to tug Gordon's shirt sleeve. Yes, the General's glare showed that he hated to be touched. What is it? Her boob, sir. Impossible. It is, General. A sandstorm coming. Nonsense. Look, Will pointed. It's close. Can't be. Not the season. The storm was now a towering monster, hot rolling waves of sand enveloping houses and bending the highest palms. It was as if the sea, in all its breathtaking immensity, had risen up and dried to red. The air was thick with it, enough to choke the fittest man. Nothing could stop the onward march of this highest, darkest doom, which if they did not go in, would soon engulf them. Knowing that the trumpet boys were too scared to move without an order, Will racked his brain for a way to shake the general from his trance. In desperation, he called, Charlie! Eyes blazing, the general whirled round. How dare you! Look! Will used both hands to keep the general facing west. Look! Even crazy old Charles Gordon, general to the British Army and governor general in Khartoum, could not miss the red mountain of sand that had blotted out the horizon. Huge, tidal surge of it coming fast, thickly laid grit and clay rear rearing out of the desert, a wall of whirling particles towered over the native city with its clusters of crudely fashioned dwellings. It would soon slam into Khartoum with enough force to split roofs and flatten homes. Off the roof, the general roared, now. Um, should I stop there because we have little time or should I read a bit more? <clears throat> I think I should probably stop. Maybe I think I should could. stop. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's so nice. <laughs> I was going to Leningrad, but you can't go from a from a from a from a sandstorm to an ice storm in one go. <laughs> so
so thank you so much, Gillian. And uh, there is something else the two of them have in common. Um, both of them were presidents of their countries, or their residence countries, uh, pen clubs, uh, Gillian Slovo in 2010, and Kevin Ireland was also president of the New Zealand pen club in 1990. So um, here we have a connection, but um, now we go from um, down under, even a little bit further down to New Zealand, because that's where Kevin Ireland um, is a native from. Uh, although he has been living in England for 20 years, and um, we are very happy to welcome him today. And just let me mention that um, he's not only a renowned author of poems, he has today, up until today, published um, 23 volumes of poetry, but also he's a writer of novels. He has published six novels and one collection of short stories, a book on growing old, and also he's a very successful writer on angling, publishing a book, How to Catch a Fish. Um, I also should mention that he has published um, memoirs and um, also he's, a, he's known as a libertist. Um, as he is, um, he's a lover of nature, as I already said. He wanted me to tell that, like all angling books, how to catch a fish is full of misinformation. I'm not so sure about that, because when I had a chance to talk myself to him about fishing, I got the impression that this is, can't be true. Um, Kevin Ireland has received many awards, including the Prime Minister's Award for Literature, and he's also a founding member and first president of the New Zealand Society of Authors. Yesterday, when I was talking to him, um, asking what he wished me to say today in the introduction, um, I was asking, Are you, how should I um, present your, your work? And because I understand it's lots about New Zealand, and of course my cliche is that New Zealand is full of nature. Um, but then he, he looked at me, he said, no, don't worry, I will get urban for tomorrow. Yeah. So um, that's all for me, and now let's listen to Kevin Ireland. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much, <laughs> There, there is nothing more urban, I think, than what has happened to our constitution, uh, which, uh, like England's, is largely unwritten or be belongs to a body of law. The cornerstone is now the treaty. Uh, many years ago, it was described as a legal nullity. Now it's very much alive. And I thought I would start off by, uh, by talking about the Treaty of Waitangi, by reading a poem about that, because this is my homage to the post-colonialists here. The Treaty was a document drawn up between people who no doubt hoped that life would continue to live up to their very best expectations. We may argue about principle and purpose, but the point beyond question is that everyone looked forward to being in some way advantaged. As long as we bear this in mind, we can fit in the rest. The wordings and wanderings, the mismatches, the grandiose definings, the gaps. It leaves us a document that may well have meant quite different things to an assortment of people at a variety of places, occasions, and times. The fact of the matter, though, is that however you look at it, or whatever you feel like thinking about it, the treaty is there. The treaty gets up in the morning, puts on a new smile, and goes off to work. 
It has a job to do, and it expects to be paid for it. In the evening, it wraps itself up in a cloak of wool and kiwi feathers, and it takes a nap while some people lie awake with nightmares. The treaty is like the sun. It gives us light and nourishment. Its shadow stretches all the way over the horizon and into tomorrow. Now, that was actually uh, used as a first-year, first-day uh, examination question to students in the law faculty, a burgeoning faculty. As the humanities get smaller, the law faculty seem to get larger and larger. This is the way of the future. And uh, 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 they were just given this single poem and told, tell me what the poem is about. Uh, I don't think I could have answered that myself. I wrote it and uh, I'd have great difficulty. Uh, another poem I wrote for the university was they thought to give me at one stage a doctorate and so uh, I thought that's a marvellous thing, a day I'll never forget when I get capped. Uh, but I wrote for the students uh, uh, a poem about the commonplace. It's called An Unforgettable Day. It was the most ordinary of days. The morning was nothing to write home about from the first bleak cup of tea to the final offhand crumple of the newspaper. The hours slumped into one long yawn until a very average noon was made even more run-of-the-mill by telephone calls that soon gave up and became dead to the world. All these dullnesses were succeeded by a lackadaisical sleepwalk through a clapped-out afternoon until, with its usual apathy, the evening pulled its blinds down on the most commonplace of sunsets. After which, I can only suppose I may have eaten something, then nodded off, though I can recall nothing precisely, just a half-knackered notion that the evening eventually gurgled away into the void of night. In fact, the slack plainness of everything that happened makes the day stand out starkly in its heavy-lidded normality. Everything was so accustomed, so entirely unmemorable, so tediously forgettable, so utterly done in, that I cannot get these non-events out of my mind. I try to think of something else, but it all keeps coming back and astonishing me. In a world of endless possibilities, it is amazing what doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I'm glad you share the feeling. That's great. Uh, it, this is also a chance for me to read a poem about Spain. Uh, I came here 60 years ago for the first time, and I can promise you the young people in here, Spanish or not, all the family stories are true. <laughs> it was a different place. 60 years ago, uh, I came here almost penniless myself, but a rich man in comparison to those I found in Tarragona. So this is an urban poem. It is what I discovered about the people I stayed with and about myself. The train was met by scouts who were out just trying to find people off the train who had come and stay in private houses. Slightly illegal, they weren't registered pensions, but, but you, you, you stayed there for about two shillings a night. And the poem is called Things You'd Rather Not Remember, and it took me 50 years to get round to writing this because it was so embarrassing. 
They stick to you like tar. You can feel the gummy ooze spurting through your toes and up your legs. Trifles, mostly, but you can never scrape them off. Like the time in Tarragona, when I took a room for 50 cents a night. I got the double bed, crisp clean sheets, and a wooden crucifix. I was the King of Spain. Then, in the morning, I saw how the family managed it. Husband and wife were sleeping on a makeshift bed on the tiles of the kitchen floor. I managed to explain. It never crossed my mind. I can't do this to you. I'm packing up, and then I'm off. Only to be begged with tears to stay. The few dollars I was bringing to the house altered its whole economy. They wouldn't let me swap beds, for I had shaken hands upon a bargain, and this was now a matter of the gravest honour. The rich aromas of small fish and vegetables and offal filled the rooms. The grub had certainly improved, but there was no way of ever getting used to it, and when at last I left, I felt I was escaping not just a gross embarrassment, but from my muddled conscience. I was young and had damn all cash myself and knew I hadn't sorted out the problem at the start. So when the city of Tarragona appears across a messy screen in my remembrance, I can only wish that couple the comfort of feather beds forever. May they live in the sanctuary of a warm home beneath a bleeding heart, with the window spilling gold coins from the moon. May they feast at a table in the kingdom of their heaven. I'm very pleased to have read that poem at last in Spain. Uh, I've uh, re recently in Sydney Airport in Mascot at uh, Kingsford Smith Airport, as it's called, uh, I, I had a, a most disturbing experience. I don't know if you know the film Casablanca. This poem is about it. it has, it's called, it was only published three months ago, Humphrey Bogart's Great Sacrifice. This actually happened. Catching a long-haul flight one night from Mascot, I heard the intercom cry out, Would passenger Mr. Victor Laszlo, Victor Laszlo, please report urgently to the front desk? Maybe all the other characters in Casablanca, like Ilsa Lund, Sam, Ferrari, and the rest, are waiting to be called for flights as at last their yellowing letters of transit come through. Even Rick and Reno would have to be there. The heart of darkness wouldn't have suited their style, and I'll bet that somehow they would have made it back to the bar to play it all again. Strasser and Ugati, of course, being dead on film, would have been let off all these tedious years of hanging about swapping airline chitties for cheese rolls while having to watch each other day and night for bad nerves and a double cross. And think of it, the survivors of those passionate Perilous days in Rick's Café American and his booze must now be well over a hundred years old, confused and coddled in blankets with nurses toting colostomy bags, bandages and medications. They would need to be wheeled watchfully out to their planes to carry on to Portugal and a freedom that must now mean something utterly different to them as they are hoisted into their seats, strapped in and wedged with pillows. I wonder whether Humphrey Bogart's misted mind ever wonders whether the pain of sacrifice was worth it. Life with Ingrid Bergman mightn't have been such fun. I know I'm mixing real life with shadows on a screen, but who could be blamed for speculating after watching Bergman 
painting Bogart with her eyes. Anyway, as I distinctly heard that night in Sydney, and however long and convoluted the itinerary, they're definitely on their way, and with no hope of trying to be their true selves ever again, it's all confused. The only certainty is that every time I watch that magic movie, I wonder who could possibly resist risking another spin of the wheel, cognac at him, elbow, knocking gingerly on wood. And I'd like to finish up by reading a poem about whatever happened to our paradise. This is the, a poem written by a man whom you may have guessed from that is now in his mid-80s. The world I lived in has entirely vanished, and I talk these days to shiftless strangers whose ideas and words must have been cast in some other place and time. Even though they seem to drift about as if they own the town, they dress in rags, they tell meaningless melancholy jokes, and all their songs are shrill and out of tune. I find these blow-ins short on common sense. They know nothing at all about politics, and they look seedy, dippy, and untrustworthy. Where could they have come from? Once upon a time, in the old world, as I knew it, all citizens knew their station without having to be told. And they believed in gods who also knew their right position. It was a world of responsibility, prudence, vigilance, cohesion, and stability. And there was no sign of this weird and terrible unrest that gobbles up lives and souls. In fact, everything was just about perfect. The supervision was such that citizens didn't even have to think for themselves, and the young were tickled pink by discipline. In the shops we bought magnificent pies with golden pastry. Apples were so juicy that you had to keep wiping your chin. And beer cost peanuts but tasted of real hops. So what happened to weaken our grip at the very moment that we reached out to grab hold of paradise? Where did all our hawk-eyed Killjoy, herring gutted guardians go. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kevin, Gillian. And as you're so perfectly fit to your time, we do have time for questions. I really invite you to, to ask, take it, advantage of the opportunity. No one? That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. You're cooperating marvelously. <laughs> Yes, there's a question in the third line. Oh, it's working now. Great. Thank you. 
Um, my question is um, more for Jelena, and I'm sorry it's not particularly about, uh, well, it's kind of about urban spaces um, and, about, and about urban literature, but it's about something that you wrote a while ago that was drawn to my attention, actually by Jacqueline Rose. She was at ECT recently um, and um, presented a uh, the, the VC's open lecture, um, and it's about, um, largely about violence and about um, systemic violences. And she referred in that to a paper or to a, um, a very beautiful essay that you wrote, um, a letter to your mother. Um, it's not it's not titled that, but you you know what I'm referring to. Um, and the line that you that she, that Jacqueline Rose brings our attention to, and that you um, in your paper rather uh, or in your in your essay rather is um, they knew exactly what they were doing. And it's something that I'm thinking about in terms of the way that we um, the way that we live and the way that we can. Um, we can be violent without intending it, um, particularly in urban spaces. And I was wondering um, if you could if you could speak to that, particularly I think in in the context of post-colonial cities um, and the metropoles. Um, you know, you you move from uh, from South Africa, uh, where we are both from. Um, I live in Cape Town currently, but I'm from Joburg, um, and uh, and yeah, and then and living in and living in London, and I mean you're living in London. <laughs> And those shifts. So I was wondering if you could just comment on the the um, unwitting but witting violence of, of yeah the, those open spaces. Um, I'm not I'm not sure I can just to give the audience and sort of a context of what the question means because I understand it but I'm not sure anybody else would. I I, I was part of an art angel project which was doing something um, on Oscar Wilde at Reading Jail. And um, six of us, I, I curated it, but also wrote, wrote the, the brief was to write letters from prison, because it was all based on Oscar Wilde's De Profundis that he wrote while in Reading Jail. And I wrote a letter, instead of um, writing a letter from prison, I wrote a letter to my mother in prison, because in 1963, my mother was held in solitary confinement. Um, for 117 days in South Africa. And I wrote a, a letter as if she was there about what the effect of her commitment had done to me. And the reason I can't really answer your question is I, um, because it was a letter not about people who do violence without intending it. It was a letter about people, not my mother, I hasten to add, who do violence while intending it. And what I was talking about was, I drew a parallel. I had just read Han Khan's book, Human Acts, which is about, I mean, I recommend it to everybody. It's a tough book, um, but it's about a massacre in South Korea that happened. And one of the things that came, hit me in the face about that book is, she very much is talking about the fact that the South Korean army and police did, committed the most incredible brutality, knowingly and willingly. And I suppose I was thinking about, um, in relation to what had happened in South Africa, the fact that, you know, unlike, forgive them, they know not what they do, which is part of the Christian tradition that we carry with us, they knew exactly what they did you know, that in a way torturers and murderers should be held responsible for what they do and not be said to have done it unwittingly. So I don't know quite how I can do it into, because I do think there is, a, is, 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 you know, there are a lot of acts of violence committed in cities which are unwitting. But in that case, I actually, what I was talking and thinking about was how you live with the knowledge that people actually sometimes do these things knowing what they did, even if they never can admit to it. So it's slightly off the... Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to ask a really obvious question uh, of you, Gillian. Um, what made you write a novel about um, General um, uh, Charles Gordon and is he the honourable man of the title? And is the title to be read straight or crooked? Um, it's always an interesting question to ask a novelist about titles, and particularly in this one, because an honourable man um, was um, 
actually not the title I chose for it. It's the title my publishers chose for it. And the title I chose for it was Virtue. Because why I wanted to write about General Gordon and why I wanted to call it Virtue and why they ended up calling it an honorable man, um, they actually thought I couldn't call it Virtue because people would think it was a prim and proper book. In fact, <laughs> while we were having this discussion, um, a book was reissued called Virtue, and it turned out to have been written by the Marquis de Sade. So he didn't have any problem <laughs> from and proper. But I lost the battle. But the reason why Virtue or an Honorable Man is that the book, the reason I wanted to write about Gordon was because this was a man who went on a mad expedition under the guise of virtue, under the guise of honor, we cannot let Khartoum fall to these, you know, these Mahdis, these, these Muslims, these... And it, it was parallel to me about what was happening in the world. And, and what I discovered when I started writing about Gordon, he's a man very unlike me, unlike me, and he's a, he was an incredibly religious man in a mad way, even for those days. Relig you know, re Christians found him a bit difficult because he believed absolutely in the Bible that everything was as had been written. The world was formed in seven days, etc. Literally, he was a total literalist and he was um, quite crazy. Actually, as I wrote on and as I kept reading his diaries, I began to quite like crazy Charles Gordon <laughs> because at least he believed in what he believed in. You know, that he was very honest in his mad way. And so that's why either virtue or an honorable man. And also an examination of what, I mean, clearly our Prime Minister, Tony Blair, is, uh, is a very concerned and makes a big deal about what a Christian he is. And is always saying what he did in Iraq was in the, you know, to be virtuous and honorable. And it was an examination of what you can do when you say you're virtuous, when you can cause so much great harm, which is what Gordon actually did as well, to people who, you know, you have, you have no responsibility for and you should not do. That. So that's why that was. Can I ask another question? Could I ask a question of Kevin Ireland? <laughs> I <Anytime>. think so. <laughs> Um, Kevin, we all know you wrote a book called How to Catch a Fish. Yes. Have you ever written any poems about such a subject? I, I've written lots of, uh, of poems about catching fish. Um, they're all full of lies. <laughs> Never, ever believe a fisherman. <laughs> There's a question um, behind there. Thank you. Um, Kevin, you're the most up-to-date, hip, 80-something-year-old I know. <laughs> so I was just wondering if you had any comments to make, either from your poetry or life experience, about being able to, at this time of your, of your life, play between being the curmudgeonly older person and um, the hip and up-to-date um, person. I think there are more than one personas uh, that you can pick and choose from. I, I can answer that, M Melissa, quite, quite truthfully, and I hope accurately. Um, writing is good for you. Uh, everybody here should recognize that. Uh, don't ever get depressed by the reception it receives. Keep on believing in it and keep on doing it because it's good for your health. It's very good for your physical health and for your mental health. It's absolutely vital. Write it all down. Keep up with it. It's it's as good as of uh, as exercises. I once heard somebody ask Leonard Cohen when he was in his eighties, "Can you talk a little bit about how much you've learnt as you got older?" And Leonard Cohen said, "I've learnt a lot." And then there was a long pause, and he said, "But I've forgotten it all." <laughs> <laughs> So isn't that a wonderful way to, to close today's session? Um, because that way we will be on time almost. And I really want to thank both Gillian and Kevin for sharing their literature with us. And thank you also for attending. And 
we will just go on in the program, just have a little pause for technical um, things we have to do, and please stay with us. Thank you very much.